And I guess we don't have to look far to see why the uh, stuff on the strategic onboarding column, why that is important. You know, you have to pick up, you don't have to pick up too many newspapers uh, to read about downsizes, mergers, acquisitions, takeovers, and you know, the, the world is full of organisations going through change. And that change comes at a cost. That change comes at a considerable amount of, of churn and uh, creates a considerable amount of movement for, for those people going through the change. In the course of putting together this presentation, I came across some really interesting facts that I want to share with you now. And for me, really just um, highlight the amount of churn that is going on in our workplace today. And you might be able to um, help me out with some of the um, answers to these questions. 40% of executives hired at the senior level are pushed out, fail, or quit within what time frame? <coughs> Any thoughts on that? 12 months. 12 months? Six months. Two years. Six months. Eighteen months. So within two two years, forty percent of executives hired at the senior level are pushed out, fail, or quit. Any surprises there? That's a that is a worry. I mean, that's a pretty big stat. Two generations ago, the average person held six jobs in their lifetime. What is the average today? 17. 17. <laughs> I was just about to say that. You've had a few more than, than most of us. 10.2. In Australia, this number of people are expected to change jobs every year. Who's, who's in the recruitment? This should be something, Barry, and yeah. any thoughts? Two minutes. Now, as I said earlier, this churn comes at a cost. Not only is there a financial cost, but there is a productivity cost. And the thing that these numbers don't reflect is, as Rory alluded to, there's all of the um, internal promotions, there's the internal secondments, internal project teams, special projects that people get put on. These numbers don't reflect any of that sort of movement. And the other thing I think we don't always appreciate is not only does this change and this level of change impact on the individual who's going through it, but their network. So the boss, the peers, the direct reports, their productivity is also influenced uh, and affected as a consequence of supporting that individual through change. So the other thing to add to that is that there will be lots and lots of people working in labour force organisations, temps and contractors, Absolutely. who ostensibly have the same employer, yeah. but are actually going through multiple onboarding processes as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, I don't know the um, I don't know the, the figures on some of no. that, but it would be extensive, no, no. as you say. Yeah. No. Has anybody read Michael Watkins' book, The First Ninety Days? Yeah. If you haven't, it's a it's a great read. I suggest you you do um, track it down. In it, Watkins talks about the break even point. The break-even point is the point at which a new hire has contributed as much value to their organisation as they have consumed from it. Now what he's saying here is that when a new hire joins an organisation, for a first chunk of that time they are consuming value. They are extracting out resources, they are sucking up resources, they are sucking up your time, they are drinking your coffee, eating your biscuits and not really giving too much <laughs> else back. Something kicks in along the way and they start contributing value. All right. 
and we reach the break-even point when they have contributed as much value as they have consumed. Question I have then is, on average, how long do you think it takes before a new hire reaches the break-even point? I really know what I want to say. Is it 18 depends. months? No. <laughs> it depends on the job. Really, it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Very it is, it is an so average. We're talking, about average. We're talking an average. Yeah. Nine Six to 12. Yeah. 6.2 months. Mm -hmm. So Watkins um, interviewed something like 220 um, CEOs. And this was the average. So what they shared with him was the time frame inside which somebody stopped consuming value and flipped over to contributing value was six and a half months. And at that point, the net contribution was zero. Beyond that point, we hope that the net contribution will continue to be positive. But um, yeah, any surprises with that figure? It strikes me as quite low for a professional role. Mm -hmm. see in a, an operational role. Yeah. When I um, first heard that, I thought about that for a while, and my immediate reaction was, okay, well, I work in the real world, and I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily have six and a half months to give a new hire time before they come up to speed. Has anybody here been a contractor or hired contractors? Yeah. Think back to, if you have been a contractor, think back to your last contracting job and ask yourself how happy your employer would have been if you'd taken six and a half months before you came up to speed. <laughs> yeah, most contracting jobs don't necessarily last six and a half months, so yeah, it wouldn't have been too happy. Now I know there's a few people here also in the IT tech space, and six and a half months in that industry is also a long time. Indeed. Yeah. Can anybody think of other jobs in which six and a half months before someone comes up to speed and starts contributing value is going to be a potential problem? Sales. Any other job? Sales? Direct sales? Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other roles where taking that length of time might be a little bit of an issue? Well, any, any highly measured task oriented yeah. job where it's very re repetitive. And yeah. so. so like retail, sales, mm -hmm. So any of those sorts of jobs, um, it's going to potentially be a problem, someone taking that length of time to come up to speed. So I guess this is where onboarding for me really adds value, in that we have at our fingertips um, a process, a methodology that allows us to claw back the length of time it takes before we get somebody coming up to speed mm. and um, hitting that break-even point a lot sooner. What I want to do now is just go through a number of rules that based on my research and work in the industry I have identified as being really the make or break points for an onboarding program and the first rule is don't leave learning and adjustment to chance. Now, smart organisations know that if we want to bring people up to speed, have a productive workforce, then, then we are going to take uh, some time to plan for that. And we're going to structure the new learn, structure the learning of the new hires. Some of the ways in which we can do this includes building an onboarding plan. Now, Rory's already talked about this. So smart organisations know that if we want a productive workforce, we need to plan and give those people a very clear directive in terms of what they're going to do day one, week one, month one, and so on. That plan is going to talk to what it is we expect them to do, what it is their deliverables are, what we're going to measure them by, and what in turn we can provide them. 
We're going to check in with those people periodically in terms of uh, what they're doing, how they're going. What are the challenges? What's working well? What do we need to tweak? What do we need to um, rejig in terms of helping you be successful? Now this is where I see technology can really add value and come into its own. Not only does our technology platform allow us to um, provide us a consistent platform for onboarding, it means that everybody is going to be hearing the same message and everybody is going to be hearing a consistent message um, inside that organisation. So there is very little opportunity for confusion. If there's no confusion, people can get on and focus and do the job that they've been hired to do. Now, this next point, give our new hires permission to ask questions. The reality is a lot of new hires struggle to ask questions. They don't know how to ask questions in terms of uh, what it is they're there to do. And so we need to make it very explicit to those people that you know we expect you to not get this straight away. We expect you to not always understand from day one our systems and processes. So we need to give them license to ask questions and we need to give them, make sure it's okay to seek feedback. If we structure the learning for our new hires, we're going to make it less stressful and um, uh, engender less anxiety for those people. Yeah? If there's less stress and less anxiety, people will be able to do what we've asked them to do from day one. Any comments on that? Does that make sense? Yeah? Certainly as competence grows, people require less structure. But certainly, first rule of thumb, from day one, we need to structure the learning to make it safe, to make it affirming, to make it um, uh, acceptable for people to get on and do the job that they're there to do. I don't know if you can see the detail of this, but this is a plan that we put in place for one of our staff uh, who quite recently came on board to my team. And it was just a two-page document, and it listed very, uh, very clearly what we expected her to do week one, day one, uh, what some of the learnings by the end of week one were going to be, and what support we would give her in turn. Now, with a little bit of modification and tweaking, this sort of plan could have application to any role inside an organisation. This was a really interesting study that was done um, a while back in the States. And what these researchers found was that by structuring people's learning, we actually gave people the confidence to socialise, to seek feedback, to ask questions and build relationships. When we didn't structure people's learning, when we threw them in the deep end and left them to sink or swim, they actually didn't do any of these things. So contrary to, I think, popular belief, you know, we assume that if we throw people in the deep end, yeah, they'll work it out for themselves. They'll suss it out. They'll make the connections themselves. In reality, people don't do any of that. We leave them to their own devices. Typically, people retrench and move into survival mode. We make it safe for them to ask questions. We make it safe for them to socialise by structuring the learning and they will do precisely that.